now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. The word now was very important to this section, at least the way I'm reading it, because of the conjunction day that's used as sequential. And it, it's what I call Greek markers. It was a way to outline a story. Verse 18, day. And it should be translated now. And because of the way, here's what he said. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. And he used day to show you in the life of Joseph how, this, how, certain, how certain events were coordinated by the will of God, by the plan of God. So day is used. It's used in verse 18. It opens every, every section. Verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, all begin with the conjunction day. Verse 22, 23 begins with day. That's, that's one. Verse 22 and 23 go together. And then verse 24, 25 go together. Starts, they start with a day. So what the writer did, at least in my opinion, what he did is he, with the words as follows, right? Verse 18, as, as, follow, as was followed. He, he's showing sequence of events that were very important in the life of Joseph in the plan of God uh, in regard to the birth of Jesus Christ. We're following that outline. And so uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows when, Mary, when, uh, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, was not willing to disgrace her. He desired to put her away privately or secretly. Privately would be a better translation. It's impossible to do it because of the legality of divorce. It would be, it, it, you couldn't do it secretly because of legal document. You could do it privately, though. You, you could either do it privately or publicly. He chose privately. Uh, when he, and now we're in our verse. But when he had considered this, um, what it, what, now pay attention, what, what's he considering? He, he's got a couple, he's got options. This word consider means he's got some options. So what's that verse tell you his options are? Now listen to it. But when he had considered this, okay, look at verse 19. He's a righteous man. Here's what he's not willing to do, and here's what he's willing to do. Are, do you see that? That's what he's considering. So it should read, Now when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared. That would be Gabriel, according to the Christmas story. He's the teaching angel of Messiah. When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, a dream saying, and then here is the message, God sent Gabriel to give Joseph. Now, here's what's important about this for your life this morning. You're sitting in this church, listen, just as clear a bell as God has brought a message to your life today that you need to hear. When you sit under the teaching of the Word of God that understands categorical doctrine, you should pay attention because God has sent a teacher to your life to teach you something. Now, I have no idea what that is. So when I prepare for teaching a sermon, I pray that God the Holy Spirit would give me information what my congregation needs because I start with a blank sheet. Even if it's out of the scriptures, I don't know where I should take it. I have no idea, but I know this. He didn't send me to teach you today and didn't send you to be taught today without, a, without confronting you with something. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you better write this verse down. You better write this verse down and pay attention to it. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Because he tells you that when you come prepared to hear the word of God and the pastor comes prepared to teach you the word of God and there is a meeting of positive volition on both parts, there is a message for you from God. Now, how big that message is, I don't know. 
But there is a message, and it's interesting to me that you can put 50 people, 100 people, 2,000 people in it, and God can meet the need of all those people with one sermon. That's amazing to me. You talk about feeding 10,000 people, that's, that's amazing to me how he does that. But I know he does it because I used to sit where you're sitting and being fed by a man who would feed me, and every time I went, I went to learn something. And God taught me every time I went. That's called positive volition and meaning. And so this is really important to you. So we got a teaching angel, and he is there. Now, for 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, is profitable for teaching, for correcting, for rebuke, and for training in righteousness so that you can be equipped to do every good work for God. In other words, that you can follow the divine plan of God and produce every, product, be a productive believer in Jesus Christ every day of your life. Listen, every day, every minute of the day. Think about that. Now, you don't have to think about it. All you have to do is be ascribed to it. What you have to do is commit yourself to it. And, and listen, it'll happen every day in your life. Sometimes you don't even know it. I mean, sometimes later, somebody will say to you, you have no idea the influence you had in my life. And you go like, you know, in your mind, you go, I don't know what it is. And they say it, and you go like, I don't even remember doing that. Isn't that interesting? God has a marvelous program, doesn't he? If we'll just be faithful to it, he'll do magnificent things in our life. And so he shows up with a, with a message from God. He sent Gabriel. Gabriel don't sit down and build this up. He says, ready for God to send. God says, here's the message. So God has to teach Gabriel so that Gabriel can teach Joseph. This is how this stuff works. God teaches me and then I teach you. That's the way it works. I know that's the way it works. I pay attention to that. Okay, so he sends him a message now, and it's about what he's pondering. This word consider means to ponder. I'll talk about it in a moment. He was pondering and had come to a conclusion that he was doing the right thing by divorcing Mary privately, right? He was not willing to do this, but he was willing to do that, right? You ought to read Matthew 1, 18 through 25 before you come to church every day because you know I'm going to be teaching on that, at least you're, if you're coming to me. So, be, be, you know, do your homework. Read ahead just a little bit would be good. Okay? So, the, so here we are, and, and the message goes from verse 20 through verse 23. I'm only reading part of it today. Joseph, son of David, notice that. He doesn't, he doesn't say Joseph, husband of Mary. He d has identified him that way, right? Yeah. But that's not how he identifies him. See, this is vocative of address. This is a salutation from, listen, this is the way God, you know, when you write a letter to somebody, you always address it. It depends how well you know the person, how well you address it, right? The salutation it all goes from high to dear to dearest to my beloved. I mean, who, right? You ought to pay attention to salutations. I guess you do when you get a letter, all right? When you get a letter, do you read between the lines? I mean, who doesn't do that? Am I the only guy that does that? You're looking for motive and what's going on and all that stuff? Sometimes you don't find anything because there was nothing. It was just plain old, and it is. Well, anyhow, jo that was free for you. That didn't cost anything. Joseph, son of David. Notice son of David. That, puts it, that links him up with Matthew 1 through 17. You know what that means? It means 6 and 16 is connected. Chapter 1, verse 6 and 16 is connected with verse 20. Because Joseph is of the house of David through Solomon, through his father Jacob. When you get to Luke, you're in a whole different genealogy. You're into Mary's. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For that which, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good way to start that, isn't it? 
you know what he did? You know what he started with in, in, in his teaching? He put his finger on Joseph's fear. Fear shuts the system down. It shuts the whole faith system down. Fear and doubt will blow you out. Right out of the system that God has got you in to fulfill his plan through your life. Fear and doubt. And so he puts his finger right on his problem on one, on one of them. Because, listen, he shows divorce and he's afraid to marry Mary. He's afraid to take Mary as his wife. Agreed? Now, now he, here's a point for you. God is never too busy to pay, a pet, to pay attention to your emotional needs and pains and anguish of heart. You get that? Who told him, who's, who's writing this sermon? God. Who's delivering it? The angel. Who's he delivering it to? Joseph. God understands your, your anguish, your emotional anguish of soul. He understands that. He understands your Gethsemane struggle. God is not too busy. He is not too busy to pay attention to your personal emotional needs. Do you get that? He says to him, don't be afraid. I understand you're fearful of this. You see, you know what he's fearful of? Listen to me. And you got to pay attention to this. The what ifs. Quit going there. You spend your life in what ifs and stall your life. Well, I would do that, but what if? Well, I, 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 that would be, but what if? But what, what if? What are you talking about, what if? If God is here now, he'll be in the what if. If he's not here now, he won't be in a what if. Why, you see, the what if is, is, is you're, you're spending too much time on you and what you think you have to accomplish in the what if rather than trusting God to do it. At some point, you're going to have to trust him. Trust him on the front side. Joseph is not willing to do that because he lives in the what if. Well, what if it doesn't work out? What if it doesn't do this? What if that? Quit that. What if? The only person that's got the what ifs is God. You don't ever should, you should never worry about the what ifs. And you spend all your time doing that. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. What if. That's about tomorrow. I'm going to ask you, what about today? You know what he's fearful of? He's, listen, there is fear in his heart about what if. And what if is not even an issue. You know what the issue is? Walk with God by faith and not by sight. What if is about sight. Don't you know that? The what ifs that shut you down all the time. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. You know, the son of David says you're connected to the bigger plan of God. Joseph, son of David, you're part of a bigger plan than what you even think about. You're in the what ifs and you're shutting down. You're not even, you're not even playing the hand that's been dealt you correctly. You're caught up in the what ifs. You're making bad decisions on the what ifs. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived to her is of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we have learned from 18 and 19 that Joseph has made his decision to divorce Mary, listen to me now, on a false assumption. 
His false assumption is she's committed adultery, and that's not true. And he's building everything off of that assumption. Everything he's been studying in the Bible is on divorce. And, and none of it can be applied to the fear in his life. He's built a mountain out of a molehill. He is, he is fearful of the what if because he's, he's based it all on a false assumption. He hasn't done his biblical homework. He hasn't asked the question, is there anything in the Bible that says that a virgin could conceive? And the answer was yes. There is. And it was a very famous Messianic Bible verse. It was Isaiah 7.14, and God is going to tell him that in verse 23. In this message that I'm only delivering part of today, in the whole message, he, he lays that out to him. He drew a false assumption. And listen, here is his problem. He's asked, no telling how many people, he's asked 100 people, 100 people have given the same answer. The natural law of, of copulation, of procreation, says there has to be a male. Right? The natural law of creation, of procreation, says there has to be a male. And he could have asked 10,000 people and got that answer. He should have asked God, is there any evidence in the Bible? He should have gone a different route of categorical thinking. Is there any evidence in the Bible? Is there any word from the Bible? And he would have found it. Isaiah 7.14. And Isaiah 7.14 wasn't an unknown scripture. It was very high on the Messianic teaching scale. Would you not think so? A virgin's going to conceive, and we're going to call his name Christ. He will, that's the way Christ will come into the world. Listen, don't you do your homework before you jump on a horse and ride in the wrong direction. Right? That's the story of Joseph. Be sure you got your ducks in a row. He had not considered the possibility of a virgin miraculous conception. Even though Isaiah 7.14, one of the landmark passages of Messiah, declared it would be the way of the birth of Christ. Didn't do his homework. Went by the natural law of creation of copulation. He knew it wasn't his. Mary always said no to him. Thank you, Mary. Wish you could come teach my teens. Oh, he said no. Goes off three months and says yes. How'd that work? But I'm a righteous man, and she, she apparently isn't a righteous woman. That's a false assumption, too. I mean, if you charge her with adultery, she's not a righteous woman, right? In the true sense of experiential. I mean, he boasts that he's righteous. In fact, God boasted that he was righteous. But listen, God boasted she was, too. Now he's got a problem. <laughs> He's got a real problem. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about six things today with six biblical principles. I'll get as far as I can, and the rest is homework. Okay? <clears throat> Here's the first one. I talked about day, that conjunction day, verse 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. There's six of them, and they're very important to the way I teach. They're, I call them Greek markers. It says, but when he, Joseph, had considered, that's an aorist passive participle, 
And it means he's, he's thought this out doctrinally. Thorough. He has thoroughly looked this out categorically doctrine. But what's he, what's, he, what's, he, what's he looking at? He's looking at divorce on the grounds of adultery. Please tell me you know that. But what he has done, he's, he's got that doctrine down pat. Except that's not the doctrine he needed. But he's got that one down pat. And apparently somebody else is going to need it because he can't apply it. Right? I mean, he's done really a yeoman job of researching the problem he thinks he has. Mary's committed adultery. How do I deal with it? Apparently, he didn't read the book of Hosea. That would have helped him, maybe. But he was on the wrong course anyhow, so it doesn't matter. The Hosea wouldn't have helped him any because he was looking at the wrong thing, wasn't he? But if he was looking at adultery, then Hosea would have been necessary to read along with everything else. Well, anyhow. Now, there's something really interesting in the Greek that the English doesn't show you. Notice that in my English text of verse 20, but when, but when he had considered this, See that word, this? See the word, this? Well, in the Greek langu language, it's tauta, T-A-U-T-A. -T Anybody in first-year Greek knows that ain't singular. Everybody in first-year Greek knows that that's an accusative plural neuter. I wrote it on your paper. It's a demonstrative pronoun. A demonstrative pronoun. It shouldn't be this. It should be these. It's plural. Tota is a demonstrative pronoun, and when you study it in first-year Greek, you learn that there is a near and far. This is a near. It's called this, but it's plural. Uh, I know. You say, well, you're quibbling about a little things. I know. This, this is singular and these are plural. This is a plural. Why is that important? Because he was talking about his options having looked at adultery and divorce thoroughly and able to reach a conclusion. He had two options. He had something he, he was willing to do and something he wasn't willing to do. He w wasn't willing to disgrace her, but he was will on divorce, but he was willing to divorce her privately. Are you with me? It's not this, it's these. See, he thinks he's got two right options. But he's barking up the wrong trail. I mean, you wouldn't take that, you would not take that hound dog out to hunt coons if he kept doing that every time you took him out. Always was up the wrong tree. I don't know if you know anything about coon hunting. I learned that in my first pastorate. I thought we were actually out there to find coons. But we were actually out there to watch dogs find them and then clap. That was a boring night for me. I thought we'd come home with something. That wasn't what the hunt was about. And so that was kind of interesting to me as a young pastor. So here's my doctrinal principle. These things refer to Joseph's internal, emotional, mental struggle with Mary's pregnancy based on a false assumption. <laughs> How do I know that he is loaded up? He's at max level because he's fearful of the what-ifs. 
Could you imagine what his inner dialogue's about? <laughs> and it's all wrong. You know what we call that? Listen to me now. We call that self-induced misery. We call that self-induced misery. If he'd have just listened to himself, talked to himself, he'd have went, this guy's nuts. And when you're in the what ifs and you're on the wrong path, all you're going to do is build a mountain out of a molehill and be miserable about it because you can't climb it. You're a dis you have disabled yourself. You could climb any mountain by faith and can't climb any in a molehill because you're out of whack. Well, apparently I'm talking to me. Apparently this is for me. That's okay. I certainly need this lesson if nobody else does. What we have by these things is a way to understand this inner turmoil that's going on over Mary's pregnancy uh, based on false assumption of adultery. He is producing so much self-misery. The longer this goes, the mountain higher, get, the higher the molehill gets. The longer he stays on this track, the worse off it's going to get. First thing you know, he'll go to a doctor, and the doctor will have on medicine so he can sleep at night and deal with his, his normal affairs of life because he's so whacked out. So they have him, he'll walk around in a stupor all the time because he's medicated. That's the way we solve problems today in America. If you'd have done that on the farm I grew up, the cow would have kicked you out of the barn. What are you doing sleeping on me? Well, we live in a culture that's just wacko. And I'm talking about the church culture. These things considered by Joseph consisted of what he was willing to do, these things, and what he wasn't willing to do. It is interesting that the word consider, listen to me now, is a Paris passive participle. I know people come in and they go like, what in the world is he talking about? What kind of a pastor is he? I just came in here to just kind of play around and go home and be miserable. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why this little heiress passive participle is important. It's because it, it identifies his problem. And in the same verse, at the end of verse 20, he gives you another heiress participle that deals with the problem. That's why it's important. Here's number point two, the word behold. See, you just, in English, you just go, behold. I don't know what that means to you. This is like, behold! That's what that is. You know why? Because it's an aorist, active, imperative. It's a command. And this word actually comes from the Greek root, horeo. Horeo means to be able to see something with the mind's eye. This is what Paul talked about in Ephesians 1.18. He talks about the eyes of your soul being enlightened so that you know exactly the will of God. That's the word, behold. I mean, it's dynamite. That's the only thing I put on that point. So you wouldn't miss it. This angel shows up. This angel shows up to teach him. And when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, and he said, he brought him a message. I call this Joseph's behold moment. This behold moment in his life is going to forever change his life. This is what we call in Romans 12 to a transformational experience that will so imprint his soul that it will change his life forever. And he's, he, listen, he was about to miss it, but God in his faithfulness was to be sure because he has positive volition and truth. He's just barking up the wrong trail, the wrong tree or whatever. 
And when God sees that in your life, he will show up and intervene to get you back on track. Is that not part of the story? God sent Gabriel. That's the top guy. Behold is used to introduce a life-changing event in Joseph's life by God. That's the aorist active imperative of the word horeo connected with Ephesians 1.18. It will be Joseph's behold moment that will forever change his life and one that he will never forget. My second point is Joseph's behold moment is God's intervening into his life because of his positive volition as a righteous believer to do the right thing for God. He desires to do God's will, but he's traveling down the wrong path by a false assumption, adultery, rather than virgin con miraculous conception. And so God shows up. Listen, he'll show up. God cares more about the choices you make and your happiness than you could ever imagine. He's 100% in your game. He's 100% into your life. God is 100% into yours, whether you're 100% into his or not. He's always 100% into you. When you have positive relationship with the truth, he'll show up and give it to you. He, and he, listen, he'll make it crystal clear. Is he going to make it crystal clear to Joseph? Oh, jeez. Amen. Listen, that's called categorical thinking. When you're hired, listen, was his eyes ready to be open to the truth? Absolutely. Behold, he had a behold moment. See, God lives for those behold moments in your life where you're struggling with something and you're caught, in, caught into between options and he shows up and goes like, you're on the wrong path. <laughs> you're on the wrong path. Listen, on the wrong path means you're traveling the wrong way mental, mentally. Oh, boy, it's so good. So we got three. An angel appears. This is the main verb. It's an heiress, passive, indicative. It's the main verb. It connects everything else in the, in the verb. It connects everything. All your participles and everything run off this main verb. And this main verb is an heiress. We know that the action of an aorist participle precedes the action, action of a main verb, but when that main verb is an aorist tense, they're, they're in conjunction. Everything the aorist participle is doing is conjuncted, is, conju is in conjunction with the, air, the main verb, which is an aorist indicative. Oh, that's so good. I know, pfft, right over, but that's still good. I mean, it's one of those jokes you hear and you walk away, and about five minutes later, you laugh. That's the, way, that's, that's the way I teach. People, I can see it in your eyes. You go like, eh, eh, eh. And then driving home, you go like, I think I, I think I finally figured out what he was saying. That's been my life as a pastor. Angel appeared. Air is passive. The main verb, everything else is working off from it. To him in a dream. Why a dream? I mean, God can do anything. I mean, when he, when he sends Gabriel to Mary, he shows up and has a conversation with her. He has to talk to Joseph in a dream. Why? Because when you're in deep sleep, you're neutral. None of this conscious foolishness. Deep sleep is a wonderful thing. That's why you get so refreshed. If it wasn't deep sleep, you would wake up in the morning just as mis more miserable than you went to bed because you're tired. And now you don't even feel good to, f I don't, I, 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 I don't want to even think about it. That's the, morning, that's the next morning. I don't think about it. Drops him into deep sleep because he's resolved some of his issues. He thinks he's got it all figured out, right? He shuts the book and goes to bed and sleeps. Drops into deep sleep. And as soon as he gets into deep sleep, where, conscious, where consciousness is no longer in charge, and now he has to deal with a, with a subconsciousness, and God can deal with that because consciousness is always about censorship. One day I'm going to do a real study with you on dreams. I haven't done that in a long time. I went back and looked. I haven't done a good study. I think I might do that in one of my Tuesday night Bible studies out there in the, the boondocks. I'm going to do it in your house. You will be amazed at what God, what God is able to do when you drop into deep sleep. When you shut off your censorship. Well, anyhow, so he appears in a dream because 
He can't, he, he, you know, he's made up his mind in, in real time. <laughs> in real time, I've made my decision. I don't like it. I mean, I, I'm not willing to do this. I'm willing to do that. It's not really a good thing. I mean, I don't say I'm going to be that, but I don't have this. But I'm going to do it anyhow. Okay, I'm going to bed. See, guys can do that, girls. I know this is hard for you to realize. Hey, we can go to, listen, we can, if we can rock it down, if we can close the book on it before it goes out, we can sleep like a baby, not you. Oh, no, no. Hey, 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 hey. I mean, he knows he's got to go work tomorrow, another day. I, you know, this is nothing compared to what I think I'll have tomorrow. Then he just shut it down and go to bed. So he does, and the Lord, Lord intervenes. Wonderful. Thank you, God, for intervening because this man has positive volition. This behold moment for Joseph was the result of a visit by a teaching angel during deep sleep, Old Covenant, who told, listen, who told Matthew this story? Do you ever think about that? See, I think about crazy stuff like this. You see, people come to me and say, well, where did you hear that? What's the, what's the story behind the story? Aren't you ever curious about the story behind the story? I am. I, I always think it about writing a book. I got more books started than Carter's got liver pills. They never get done. I get a first chapter and put them down because all of a sudden I'm into another craziness. But I see, I think this way, so I write it down. There's a possible book. It'll be a gate question when I get to heaven. How come you wrote all these books and never have got them completed? Be a gate question for me. Well, listen, in this deep sleep, who told Matthew this story? You know what I would say, the book I would write about? Joseph. He heard this story so much from Joseph. Do you know those transformational, the whole moments in your life when God shows up and does impossible things in your life? Do you know those moments? Oh, please tell me you've had one at least. They become your testimonials. If somebody else is in that thing, oh, you got, boy, do you have an a whole moment for them, testimony, right? Don't you know this? Listen, no doubt this was the whole moment in his life. I mean, he drops out of history after this. So where did Matthew get this? I mean, Matthew got it down into, either, listen, Al, even into inner dialogue. I mean, where did that kind of testimony? Gabriel show up and show, tell Matthew? No, uh -uh. he told Joseph. Joseph told Matthew, don't you imagine? See, my book would go all into those meetings when Joseph would go like, oh, you're not going to believe this. And, and Matthew would hear that story over and over and over and over again. And you know why? Because, listen, when he wakes up in the dream, he's going to take Mary as his wife, and he's going to take Jesus as his adopted son, and he's going to raise him honorably for, the, for God's child, and he's going to take all the heat that Mary had, all the heat that Mary was supposed to take because committing adultery. Listen, you think that, do you think the enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ is going to let this story die? Do you think that 10 million people who have been questioned whether a virgin can be conceived, are you kidding me? You know who's going to carry, you know who's going to carry the cross for Mary? Who's going to carry it for Jesus? It's going to be Joseph. Because in John, the eighth chapter, the enemy is going to come back and push it in the face of an adult Jesus Christ that he was born of fornication. You know, they're slugs, aren't they? If you think, that, if you think your enemies fight fair, you're wrong. They're corrupt from the core. Jeho Listen, I believe this is Joseph's behold moment of transformation. It became his testimony of his life. Joseph's behold moment, here's my point, but Joseph's behold moment was a life-changing experience, a spiritual transformation in Joseph's life. Like, like Romans 12, 2 says, when transformation hits your life, and changes it so dramatically, it pushes you to the will of God where you understand it is good, it's acceptable, and it's complete. 
Joseph, that's his testimony. That's a transformational experience. It becomes your testimony of life. And the more of them you have, the more testimonies you have. Transformation leaves you with a testimony of the power of God in your life. You ought to be having them on a regular basis. Transformation is a normal process of a spiritual mature believer. And you ought, to, you ought to pull yourself up out that muck and mire of self-induced misery in your life and get back in the game. S -s -s Stop sitting there and saying, why me, God? Why me? Why me? Why don't you start thinking about other people? Stop praying so much for yourself and start praying for other people. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Then you could get involved in their testimony because you don't have one of your own anymore. Yours is stale and all cold and morbid. You don't even talk about it anymore. Not Joseph. He went to bed that way. He couldn't talk about Mary anymore. It's too painful. I had to break up with her. This miserable. All self-induced. Forgot to ask, what's the Bible say about a virgin conception? Is it possible? Why, why wouldn't that a logical question to ask? It was true. She was a virgin. And his a virgin? Can a virgin? Is there any evidence in the Bible for a virgin having a miraculous conception? The answer is absolutely yes. It was a major messianic doctrine. A teaching angel... Uh, verse, I'm done. I am done. Huh. This is a pointer. I went to pull it open. It doesn't open. It's just a pointer. Well, you may never see me on this passage again. I don't know. I'll talk to the Lord about it. Because I am interested in going to verse 21, but if I do show up, it'll be Tuesday night with this verse. But I don't know. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this lesson. I knew when we had six points, it'd probably be too long, but what do I know? We'll see. Did I say enough to resolve the points, Father? Did I say enough? I know you'll tell me. We'll either pick it up because we haven't covered enough or we think we've covered enough to leave it on the paper and let people work it out. But we're thankful, Father, that you've given us the message. We've looked at from the start to the finish on verse 20. Even though we can get through it in an hour, we're still thankful for it. I pray, Father, as we take our offering, we would understand that we give according to our heart, not according to our wants or wishes and all that. What's, it's, what, does it, how, what are you saying to our hearts about giving? Giving of our time, giving of our money, giving of our facilities. sharing our car to help people, people get to the doctor's office when they need to or go, get to the grocery store when they need it. Give them a ride to church and back, even though it's inconvenient for ourselves. It's a ministry. How about the person that would like to go to church if they had a ride? They would never ask for it. We could call them up and say, do you need a ride? And they would be like, oh, I thought, oh, I would just love that. There are a lot of ways, a lot of ways to give, Father. But listen, all of it has to come from the heart. It doesn't come from the wallet. It doesn't come from a timetable. It comes from our heart. Because where our heart is, where our treasure is. Where our treasure is, where our heart is. They, they, they ought to be synonymous. I pray that this Christmas. This is what Christmas is about. Encourage our hearts, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.